Hello, Game Cove fans, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Stephanie Pelly, and we are the only video game show in Atlantic Canada. We're bringing you the latest and greatest on what's going on in the video game industry, made even better by doing it right here in the Atlantic provinces and talking to some local folks as well. Here's what we have coming up for you in this episode. We had a chance to speak with Alpha Dog Games, an indie studio based in Bedford, Nova Scotia, who are hot off the release of their latest title, Wraithborn. We get the inside scoop on what it's like to be developing games right here in Atlantic Canada. The Consumer Electronics Show is one of the largest conventions in the world for the tech industry, and there were a few big announcements this year that are likely to influence gaming into the near future. We're bringing you the highlights for gamers from the show and letting you know what you should be getting excited about. Just in time for the much-anticipated reboot of this season of The Walking Dead, Ian's here to give us a look at the show's award-winning game from Telltale Studios. Is it deserving of those Game of the Year kudos? Well, you'll get the chance to find out. And finally, we head to New Brunswick to talk to the folks at Atlantic Gaming, a student association at UMB. They recently hosted a Halo 4 tournament to celebrate the launch of the latest game in the series, and we were there to catch all the action. Arguably the biggest news coming out of CES 2013 was the push behind 4K technology. 4K is the next evolution in high definition, or Super HD as it's often referred to. Manufacturers were tripping over themselves this year to show off their 4K displays on laptops, tablets, and television. And while all this is great news for the video file, what was left unanswered was how 4K will appeal to the average consumer. And more specifically, what does it mean for gamers? 4K media requires massive amounts of storage. Now consider that the space of a Blu-ray disc is required for HD content in a movie or game. There's obviously going to need to be a larger storage capacity or a faster and more accessible on-demand digital distribution method for devices and services supporting Super HD. Netflix has already announced its backing for 4K titles in the States, and it seems likely that other large services like Hulu, Amazon, and Apple are going to follow. But realistically, this may be all for nothing, with the ever-looming problem of bandwidth restrictions that these services are faced with. So what does this mean for gamers? Well, we may ultimately see some awesome visual upgrades in the future, but it's likely this won't be for a long time. Of course, no one has come out and said if the next generation of consoles are going to be 4K ready, but odds are they probably won't be given the issues of storage. And just try to imagine not only the price tag of a 4K-ready Sony or Microsoft console, but also a 4K display device to play it on. There's no doubt this would make the next gen of consoles prohibitively expensive even for hardcore gamers, and could make casual players shy off completely. It's most likely PC users will be treated to the first round of 4K upgrades, but it remains to be seen how game publishers will address the elephant in the room. We might have to look at CES 14 for a better answer on that. It's pretty safe to say gamers have embraced tablets as a versatile and fun playing platform. And noted peripheral company Razer threw down the gauntlet this year at CES with their announcement of the Razer Edge, what they describe as the first gaming tablet to be released to the masses. This marks Razer's second largest non-accessory-based announcement after the release of their somewhat popular Blade, a heavily customized laptop also designed for gamers. Now the Edge is rocking some pretty powerful specs, an i-series processor, 8 gigs of RAM, NVIDIA 6 series GPU, and a minimum of 128 gigabyte SSD for the Pro line. These are specs that would make a lot of laptops turn green, and yet it's all jammed into a 10-inch tablet not much larger than those currently in market. Of course, all that power isn't for Angry Birds. This tablet runs Windows 8 and is more than capable of supporting most current PC games and those in the foreseeable future. But of course, the question that remains is how are we going to play our favorite games on a tablet? Well, Razer also has stepped up its game by allowing for several very distinct user modes, along with additional accessories to solve this problem. For starters, the device can be used in tablet mode for all tablet functions available in Windows 8, along with running any application that supports touchscreen input. There's also an available keyboard dock and a USB port that would support a mouse to allow for a more laptop style of use, but neither of these are really news when it comes to tablets. What is news is the two other modes this tablet's capable of running. Razer has announced an innovative gamepad dock which attempts to bridge the gap between tablet controls and the more familiar controller type play that many gamers are used to. We're also looking at a media dock mode. While again not an earth-shattering revelation for tablets, what makes this announcement more exciting is the push to interacting with services like Steam's Big Picture, which allows us to seamlessly segue into another big CES show item, Steambox. As we mentioned earlier, it's rare for specific gaming announcements to be made at CES, but Steam broke convention this year and was on hand to give more details about their standalone game system, Steambox. Now, game system seems a little vague, and it's questionable what sort of impact Steam hopes to make on the console market. But what is clear is that Valve wants to bring Steam into your living room, and realizes that there are big challenges in doing this. This is already pretty apparent with their recent release of Big Picture, allowing for a more TV-friendly interface for their online storefront. 
What Valve did give up is that they are creating a device that's capable of delivering content from Steam, not only to the living room, but to multiple devices in the home. They're also pushing to have this service based on a Linux platform, and in fact, Gabe Newell, head of Valve, wants to assure the Steam user base that this platform is meant to be open and accessible, bringing the virtues of PC gaming into more areas of the home. There was a lot of confusion regarding exactly how this model would be implemented. Adding to this confusion were two other very similar products on display at CES, the Piston and the Shield. Both products implement NVIDIA's Kepler technology to wirelessly stream games from the PC onto other devices, be they a modified Android display controller, in case of the Shield, or more traditional living room media PC type device in the Piston. While Valve was quick to point out that neither of these devices were really what they had in mind for Steambox, and even went as far as to let it be known that they'd be developing internally, but both of these products represent the ideal that Valve has in mind for Steambox and will ultimately be part of the total solution for Steam accessibility throughout the home. We're here at Alpha Dog Games, right in our own backyard in Bedford, Nova Scotia, and we're talking to Nick Riley, who's a co-founder as well as the design director. Nick, thanks for letting us uh, come in here and check out your office. No problem. Thanks for coming. So it's the three of you guys here. How did how did you all come together and decide to, to go off on this venture? Well, it's, it's really kind of funny how we all ended up in the same place. We'd all actually worked for THQ Incorporated at one point in our careers. I knew Sean from working back at Relic Entertainment, and we went separate ways in our careers after that. And then um, I met up with Jeff here. He'd worked on Homefront for THQ as well. So we, we all worked for the same company at some point and ended up here in Nova Scotia later and we've been, our background is a lot in action games and strategy games, so our focus here at Alpha Dog is to develop the best action strategy games on the mobile platforms. So what's your role within the company? What, what are you bringing to the team? So I'm the technical director here, um, which you know, means most of what I do is writing you know, gameplay code, so uh, um, you know, making the guys move around and doing the math on, on how these guys you know, hit each other with hammers or fire off bolts. But, uh, we're a small team, so I get to do a lot of things like, um, you know, effects work and animation work. So, you know, I get to flex my creative muscle a little, but most of what I do is, is uh, gameplay programming. So as an art director, what role do you kind of play within the development of a game? Um, it's pretty much everything to do with art. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we hired uh, a concept artist, a very talented guy, who's done, uh, if anyone knows from the RPG world, uh, Pathfinder. Um, he's a Mexican artist that we reached out to and he did a lot of the concept art for us. So uh, my job is to direct them and also to create the art itself. So pretty much the entire game is created by myself, uh, aside from a good friend of mine that also helped out with a couple of characters on the side. So uh, yeah, almost everything in the game is, comes from me in one point or another, from the menus to the trees to, uh, to, uh, to the characters and the weapons. Ooh, Triple H! He was uh, inspiration behind the hero. The no way! His body proportions and, and... So can you tell us about maybe some of the current projects you're working on, what you're able to tell us, I yeah. guess? Could I imagine some of this is probably a little... Yeah, no, one of the benefits of being an indie developer is we can be a little bit more open. We don't have big corporations behind us telling us what to do. But um, we are currently working on Wraith. We've developed Wraithborn. We've released it. We're currently working on the Android version of Wraithborn and then working on another IP at the same time. That, that one we're not really ready to talk about yet, but it's science fiction based. Any plans to move into like maybe a console or a PC? Like yeah, I mean, we a lot of us got our start in PC development, so PC gaming is definitely a, a big importance for us. Um, we're probably going to make it for any of these evolving game platforms that come out, those micro consoles like Ouya and GameStick, and uh, look at those, but it's we'll take it as it comes. In our next content update before we re release on the Android are uh, some armor variations that we can get. Well, here are some rough sketches that I did. Uh, in terms of touch controls, how easy or difficult is it to design for that? It really depends on where you're coming from. Touch controls can be a really unique challenge because you don't realize just how big your fingers are until you start to push things on a very small phone and realize that you're taking up half the screen with that finger and you can't see the guy underneath it when he's running around. So that's a unique challenge that honestly you expect it, but when it comes time to do it and implement it, it's really a challenge to figure out how best to capture those controls. 
um, we had to make some design changes to our original vision where to get your fingers off and away from the screen so you can see the cool stuff that's happening. Uh, the Uber Hammer is the biggest and the best and when you see them all side by side it reads really well. And the last one is the Gem Breaker which gets you uh, doubles your gems in the game as you're breaking it. So if you're ever to get anything in the game that's probably the first hammer that people want to get as a, as a tip because it doubles your, your gem counts and then you can buy the other ones from there. Your opinion of indie versus like AAA titles, um, what do you think would give the better gaming experience? Um, each gives their own unique gaming experience, each brings positives. Uh, one of the interesting things working as an indie developer now, independent, is we're a really small team focused on making the best games possible, so we get a lot more control and a lot more development influence over every aspect of the game. You know, indies bring a lot of sort of unique, they're, they're not confined by the same constraints that a, that a AAA company has where, um, you know, uh, they sort of have to make you know, big budget, big spectacle games, which is, you know, also awesome in its own way. But an indie can actually flex their muscle and do something unique and creative that there may not be a market for at the time, but they can take that risk and go out and do something new. From my perspective, I've, I've had a lot of fun with the big blockbuster games. And uh, we had some really good team awards, you know, back in the original Dawn of War team, we won a THQ team award and that was a lot of fun. A lot of guys have moved on to bigger and better things, you know, at Blizzard Entertainment and such. So. That's, that's exciting to work with a team like that, but uh, you know, I really find the passion behind indie games and being really hands-on on every decision that gets made is, uh, is where it counts for us. And you, know, you can change things at any time, so that's generally what I do during the course of the day is uh, play with Lego blocks, really, is what a game designer gets to do. In terms of some inspiration and maybe some support that you've gotten like for the company, what what has really kind of you know boistered Alpha Dog Games over the past year? Well, really early we had some great support from local government agencies like Cohen and SBI. They were really helpful to get us off the ground and started on the business end, and some support from some local business mentors. But really, it's the fact that we started to establish fans very early. We released our trailer, and suddenly we were getting uh, emails and uh, LinkedIn in and Twitter invites from people saying that they were looking forward to the game. And that's really inspirational, seeing that what we're creating, people want to play. So say you're at a show, you're kind of approached by a young whippersnapper who wants to get into game development. What's probably the best advice that you'd be able to give them? <laughs> well, the best advice is make games. It, and it sounds funny, but it's true. Is Find a game that you love, make a mod for it, develop games for it. Coming at it from a technical perspective, stay in school, do well at math, you know, go to, to have a computer science degree. Um, but outside of that, uh, it's, you know, make games because you can, you can make games in a lot of different ways. There's map editors, and, you know, you can go make your own StarCraft levels, you can build mods, you can do all kinds of things. Like I started out uh, painting cars and painting jerseys back in the NHL hockey days and stuff like that, getting my own teams out there. So, uh, you know, anything that you could do in a game, it really sells itself as well. What's your favorite game? Can you tell us maybe your favorite game um, that you've developed and maybe your favorite game of all time that maybe you've not had a hand in developing? Well, I mean, the easy answer is always, well, it's Wraithborn, because that's the last game we did. But, you know, I have a special tie to Dawn of War 2, which is the game that I was probably, it was my first big game as a game designer because I developed the first hour of that. So if, if I was to pick a game that was my favorite, it'd probably be that. I've got a lot of favorite games. From a kid, it would, you know, it would be some of the old, you know, sports games in Nintendo, like SNK Baseball Stars. But, you know, as an adult, as a game developer, I play a lot of games, so, um, you know, saying one's better than the other is hard. I guess right now, on the phone, I'm playing a lot of Battleheart and a lot of Clash of Clans, but I like what they're doing. Uh, my favorite game of all time, um, it, it, I really enjoy the God of War series, just because the, uh, the art style for one thing and the story, how, how well it was really driven. Uh, speaking mostly on the first one because that was my best experience. You're looking forward to Ascension? Yes. All right, now where would viewers be able to go to find out more about Alpha Dog Online? Where would people be able to find out about like news and announcements? Well, pretty much everywhere that we try to get to. So the best place to go is, is alphadoggames.com. If you want more about the game, wraithborn.com with an E. And otherwise, we're Twitter at Alpha Dog Games, and we have a Facebook as well. Awesome, Nick. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, this is actually the first time we've uh, we've had a indie developer on the show, so this has been quite an experience and and very insightful. So thanks so much. That's great. Thanks for coming out. You can actually get Wraithborn in the Apple App Store right now, and check out Alpha Dog Games online for all the news and announcements. And to tell you the truth, my previous experience with Telltale Games was quite positive. 
So there I was again, feeling excited as I was waiting to see what these guys would do to one of my favorite TV and comic series. 